Hello and welcome to TNCRadio.live. This is Trucker's Life Radio. And now here's your host, Ron Frazier. This is Ron Frazier and we welcome you to Trucker's Life Radio. I'm happy to have Tom Wolf along with Derek Thompson with us on our Trucker's Life Radio program. Tom is a professional driver or has been a professional driver for over 21 years. He got involved in youth ministry at the age of 47, something we'll talk to him about. And he's got a master's degree in counseling with his own practice. And Tom is also the area director for Priority One Ministries. Tom, Derek, we're glad to have you guys with us today. Uh, Tom, you know, I shared a little bit about your background, but tell us about your background and some of the transitions you've made in your life and why and how they came about. Will you do that, Tom, for us, please? Sure. Thanks for having me on, Ron. And, um, and Derek, it's good to, to be with you guys. <clears throat> um, my story um, really revolves around a relationship with God. I mean, I know that this is primarily a religious broadcast, but my life is inseparable from the fact that at 24 years old, um, my wife and I gave our lives to, to Jesus Christ. And something very profound happened in our world and, and our lives. And it, it became the focal point of our lives from then until now. Uh, we will be married 47 years this this month, and it's been a wild ride. So <laughs> I found myself at 25 years old with a pregnant wife and no real way to support a family. Um, and through a, a long series of circumstances and what, what I would say probably miraculous events, the Lord led me into a truck driving school. Um, I always did love driving. I had had a small dump truck, but I couldn't find a way to get into a larger truck where I could actually support my family. So uh, the Lord led me into this uh, trucking school, which obviously everybody that's been there knows that that doesn't get you a job, <laughs> um, even regardless of what they promise. But after applying to over 35 companies and having nothing come up, um, God opened a door for me to go to work with a company in Northeast Philadelphia, a Christian-based company, to honor God in all that we do was a foundational corporate statement, and um, it, was, it was a great place to drive. Um, they were committed to driving everything legal and above board, and because of that, uh, in 26 years, um, 20, my 21, but I know years beyond that, with 26 drivers averaging 100,000 miles a year, they had never had a serious accident. So I feel like God did honor, honor that in them. But from the time I gave in my life to Christ, I felt called to the ministry. I had no idea what that even meant because I was a pretty staunch agnostic slash atheist up until the moment Jesus said, <laughs> that's, that's over, now you're with me. And uh, I felt this internal just call to ministry. Um, so when the Lord opened the door to drive a truck, we thought, my wife and I, that this would be maybe three years to five years, and then we would be led into ministry. Um, 20 years later, and four children later, <laughs> that had not happened. Although I listened to the best radio preachers in the world for years. I, I was being trained by all of these guys, giants of the faith. And um, so that was pretty amazing. At 46, I think I was, um, I was always involved in the church, preached, taught, did every job that was, was there, but it couldn't find a way to get there full time. At 46, uh, the youth pastor there and I were having breakfast and he said, you know, you can go uh, to school at Biblical Theological, or not, uh, at Philadelphia Biblical University and get a degree in Bible going on Saturday mornings. So Saturday mornings, I was always home, so I signed up and um, quickly got involved there, and about a month later, I was on Route 29 from Charlottesville to Lynchburg, and the phone rang, and it was my church calling me to come and be the youth pastor. <laughs> So that was 
quite a turn. And um, I, I said, okay, I, I first asked my two children who were still in the youth group, and they gave me green lights. And so that began um, a long time of youth ministry, almost 16 years. And uh, during that time, I went back to school and got my master's degree in counseling. And um, yeah, that took us up to about four years ago when I transitioned into uh, the priority one area director for Delaware Valley, which is just a ministry reaches out to men and you can do it however God is calling you to do it. So our ministry here is pretty much about putting on Wild at Heart boot camp weekends for men, um, one-on-one mentoring, Bible studies, book studies, and uh, groups being led in the evenings for guys who are addicted to pornography. God began to bring men primarily to my counseling ministry. Today, it's all I do is men and marriages and uh, trying to muscle up against the pornography epidemic in our, in our culture. Um, yeah. Tom, you shared that you and Cindy had been married for 47 years. And during that period of time, you were driving truck, as I understand it, for about 20 years. Share with us and our listeners, what were some of the expectations that uh, you each had going into uh, this relationship uh, as a truck driver? And by that, I mean, you know, expectations don't just concern your finances, it's extended to child rearing. It's extended to your family activities and your profession. How, how did you, how were you two clear on the responsibilities you each were going to take on um, while you were apart and when you were together? How, how did you come, uh, how did you handle the expectations of driving a truck and raising a family? Well, in the first place, neither of us had expectations that it would be a, a full career of 21 years. We, we thought it was short term. And so there were many, uh, many things we had to sort through and work out as the time went on. There would be times when we would be very frustrated with the situation and we would, we would pray and I would look for a local job and the local jobs wouldn't pay anywhere near as much. And we would find some peace and we would, we would be back in a, in a place of at least semi-contentment. But my wife was there. Uh, one of the largest, probably the single largest struggle I had on the road was the reality of leaving my wife home with four children to raise. We had three daughters and one son. And the other part of that was leaving my son at home with four women and, <laughs> and one bath. So that was quite a, quite a challenge. And we have to shift relationship roles because she had to be everything for the, for the however many days I was gone. And thankfully, I was home every weekend. But for instance, as a small thing, we started out, she wanted to, you know, as a way to discipline, tell the kids, well, wait till your father gets home. And we quickly realized that probably wasn't a good plan. I said, look, the kids will never want their father to come home. So <laughs> you need to handle the discipline during the week, and I'll take it over when I get home, um, primarily. Uh, and there were episodes where, you know, we were at dinner, and one of the kids would do something, and she would issue a consequence without even looking in my direction because that's what she did all week. So we had a talk um, on the side, and I said, look, I will always support you. Whatever you say, I support that. But we need to talk afterwards so you can have some input from me, and we can maybe modify the consequence or do whatever. So that shifting of the roles for her, that was something we had to grow into. We had, a, had conversations about prayer, prayerfully look uh, for forward directions, but Boy, you know, it, she would cut the grass. She would, we had animals. She would do all of that. And uh, when I came home, I said, okay, you need to leave. You know, and she said, where will I go? I said, you can go sit in the yard for two hours for all I care. You just need to get out of the house, go unwind, and let me take the kids for a while. So 
we tried to be very cognizant of the challenges for one another and work them out in a way that would work for both of us. It had to be a difficult first year or two and uh, for you guys to make that adjustment. Tom, I want to talk to you a little more about the expectation situation uh, and especially in relationship to uh, your children and how they responded to all this. But uh, before we do that, uh, we need to go to break. So, Tom, we'll pick it up after break. Thanks. Did you realize that since the pandemic began, there's been about a 1,000% increase in online alcohol sales? And did you know that the overuse of alcohol is one of the key factors in relationship issues and emotional and attitude struggles? Let's shatter all alcohol struggles with number one best-selling author David Essel's online video course, Addiction Recovery, for only $39.95 at TalkDavid.com. Discover the real cause of alcohol dependency and the key steps to take to create a healthier, more peaceful life. Be free. Grab David's video course, Addiction Recovery, for only $39.95 at TalkDavid.com. Welcome back to Trucker's Life Radio with Ron Frazier, right here on TNCRadio.live. This is Ron Frazier, and we're on Trucker's Life Radio. I have on the program today Derek Thompson and Tom Wolf. Uh, We've been talking about the expectations between a husband and wife uh, when the husband is an over-the-road truck driver. Uh, Tom, there's some points I want to pick up from where we left off before break. Uh, Tom, first of all, how did your children respond to the idea, dad's not home, and uh, they had to deal with mom uh, for a good portion of the time? Yeah, um, well, I, I guess in a, in a way I'm thankful that I went on the road uh, when our very first child was very young. So this was really the only life they knew. Um, so it was, it was adjustments. Um, I, somehow God was gracious that I was able to be at the birth of all four of my children. And I don't think any of them came on time because that's what kids do. Um, But I somehow was there, and that was a huge blessing. I feel on one hand that I missed so much of my kids' lives, but on the other hand, we we made things work. We made birthday celebrations work. It didn't have to be on their birthday. They didn't really care. It was whatever day we could make it work. Um, Same somewhat with holidays. And I've had uh, a lot of regret. I mean, my my biggest regret about driving all those years was that I couldn't be with my children the way I wanted to be. And I have gone back to each one of them now as adults and apologized for that. And each one has said, Dad, we don't remember it that way. We, We remember you being present for so many things for us. And like, please don't beat yourself up about it. And so I'm very grateful for that. But I, I do know, especially for my son, uh, that it was, it was difficult. And um, it was interesting that uh, he ended up in the Marine Corps for eight years. <laughs> so I guess he had some things to prove maybe, but, um, you know, and, and the kids are growing and developing the whole time. And Cindy had a lot on her plate and there were times I think especially with the girls when uh, they begin to really push back around early teens, 13-ish, and again around 16. And during those times, I just asked Cindy to, look, just get through the week, be their friend, and I'll work with it when I get home. Let me be the the hard guy and you, you be the friend, okay, as much as you're able. And that worked out for us well. I moved in closer to my daughters. I I always had a thing of kind of dating my children. You know, it was, I would make times uh, when I'd be home, I'd get home on Thursday night. I might take one of the kids out of school first period to go to breakfast with me. They thought it was hysterical. And I just, I was, I couldn't lie. So I would write their note, please excuse whoever it was for being late. They were at breakfast with their father (laughs) and the school secretary would just laugh. I thought she thought it was great. 
Um, there was a time in my son's life growing up where my, you know, and this is what's really hard because the father is so instrumental in the formation of the son. And there was a time where my wife got very frustrated and she saw it before I did. And she said, you know what, when you come home, you need to strap your son to your back. Where you go, he goes. What you do, he does. And so we did that. And um, that turned out to be a great thing. I do have a great relationship with my son now. We get to go camping together, his family and us, and, and we enjoy a lot of things with all of our grown children. So somehow we got through it. And um, I, I think a lot of it was God and a lot of it was paying attention to each other and making the adjustments that needed to be made for us to help the kids get through this kind of a life. Tom, I, I don't know if you and Cindy were goal setters at all, but my question to you is, it sounded like there were areas, especially with your children, that you targeted, like you made a point of having a date relationship with your daughters when you were home. What other kind of goals or what other kind of priorities did you set that um, – were directed towards your family. So then when you were not driving, you were home, um, you were going to do these specific things. Were there other things that was well that uh, were geared towards your children or even to Cindy herself, uh, just in building a date relationship with her? Yeah, my, um, my go-to non-negotiable or every man I counsel is that date night is not optional. Um, you dated your wife to win her. What you want her with, you have to keep her with. So date night was not optional. I tell every man date night, Friday night, unless the house is on fire, then it's on Saturday night. And it's not about spending a lot of money. Um, I said, you spend your money on the babysitter. So you have somebody that wants to say yes every time you call. As, as far as the actual date, you know, we would go to Starbucks at 10 and 9 and they would all leave at 9 and we would sit outside until 11. So date night wasn't all of the disasters of the week. Date night was how is your heart? Date night is when we pursue each other at the level of the heart. We talk about our dreams and how we're doing and where do you see yourself in five or 10 years? And you know, even that was a challenge because I was taking that out of the little bit of time that we had with our kids. But I remember James Dobson saying that husbands, the greatest gift you can give your children is to love their mother. And so we were openly affectionate in our home. The kids knew that I was always pursuing their mother. And I, I think that that made a difference. Our children are all happily married and have wonderful spouses. And I, I've got to think that that priority had something to do with that. As far as career goals, it was three to five years. <laughs> but our biggest goal beyond that was to follow the Lord. And mm. I God, you clearly led me into this job. And I would like you to clearly lead me out of this job because I'm listening every day. <laughs> wow. So the timeline ultimately was this. Yeah. Tom, you, you talked about working hard at your relationship with Cindy and also working hard at your relationship with your family. Tell, share with us, what were some of the stresses you experienced with having a long distance relationship? You know, how did the time apart create stress on your relationship, uh, even though you were working hard and making sure uh, it didn't become problematic? What were some of those stresses? Well, the stress of, of things happening at home that I really needed to be a part of and couldn't be a part of. For instance, our youngest daughter had a puppy and our middle daughter was going out somewhere and was told to tie the puppy up outside, which she thought she did. And she came home and there was no puppy and uh, my wife was very frustrated with my daughter and said, you, you need to go find the dog, which she did. He had been hit by a car down the street from our house. And she called me and she was hysterical. She said, I killed the, the puppy. And, you know, in those moments, I was uh, 500 miles from home. 
And I, you know, I feel it now. It's like I would have walked home to be with my daughter in that moment. So it was those kinds of things that were just so heart hard, you know, and um, same with my wife. There was times when it, it just got to be a lot. I mean, everything that had to be done fell on her and she did most of it. I mean, she didn't just create a big list for me when I got home. I had enough things to do when I got home, but um, that, that thing of missing these critical moments, that was the hardest for, for me. Um, so they, they was the stress missing holidays, missing, uh, you know, we, we were home pretty much for every major holiday. We would miss some minor ones here and there, but you know, our family, my wife's family liked to do a lot of things on Sunday afternoons. And I had to leave Sunday morning for most of my career. The last couple of years, I had a Monday morning to Thursday evening run. And that was uh, a real blessing and an opportunity to try and make up some time with the kids. But there's no shortage of stresses on a driver when, when you live and, and are that far away from home so much of the time. Wow. Tom, we want to talk about here in a minute, you know, the issue of loneliness and the effect that that can have on trust and or fidelity and some other things. Uh, and so when we come back from break, I want to ask you about those specific issues. What's it like to be on the road, uh, to experience loneliness and um, the issue of trust and fidelity? Did that ever come into question? And so as soon as we get back from break time, uh, we're going to pick this up and continue that conversation. Kathy DeCaro is nothing short of amazing. She not only drives the world's biggest truck as a heavy equipment operator in Northern Alberta, Canada. She's an international motivational speaker and the author of Dream Big, an autobiography about overcoming a lifetime of trauma and abuse that led to dreams of success. Kathy inspires people the world over to change their lives and improve their self-worth. Her book will change your life. She's passionate about personal growth and believes anyone can change their circumstances and overcome their obstacles if they believe in themselves. Her life will amaze you and seriously inspire you. Be sure to order a copy of her book, Dream Big, on Amazon.com. Welcome back to Trucker's Life Radio with Ron Frazier, right here on TNC Radio Live. We're here on the program talking with Tom Wolf, and we've been talking about the issues of marriage and being an over the road driver and some of the issues that come into play. Tom, I want to talk now about the issue of loneliness. One of the biggest problems over-the-road truckers have and have experienced is the issue of loneliness, and that often puts them in a bad place. And so my question to you is, how did it affect you? And with many drivers, that puts them in a bad place because it puts them in a place of uh, their spouse not trusting them or a fidelity issue. Uh, did you and Cindy ever have issues of trust and fidelity, uh, did they ever come into question in your your marriage and your relationship? Hmm. Well, um, yeah, there's a, there's two, two things there that you brought up that are sometimes associated, but then not necessarily. So uh, the loneliness thing, um, people used to ask me about loneliness and boredom. And um, I loved driving. I really, uh, there's, there's a lot more to do driving a big rig than there is driving your car. So there's are always things to pay attention to. And, um, you know, it wasn't lonely. Um, yeah, I kind of, the loneliness would come in when I knew I was supposed to be somewhere else and I couldn't because I had to do my job, I guess. 
Um, the other, the fidelity issue comes in with, uh, I will say when I started my career in 85, there, were a, there was a lot of prostitution and stuff openly almost in the truck stops. And that was, uh, that was pretty cleaned up through the years be, as truck stops kind of converted from being truck stops to travel plazas. And they knew they were getting a lot of families in there they kind of put a, a, a greater effort toward cleaning up things that were kind of that visible. And I, I know with Transport for Christ, there's a huge emphasis now on the, on the trafficking situation. That, I guess, has kind of taken over. Uh, just this summer, we were on a vacation. We pulled into a truck stop with our camper, and you could just tell something was going on in that truck stop. And so... Um, you know, there's there's always going to be things out there that we need to be careful of. And this comes down to a man or a woman's integrity. And there, there were so many wonderful drivers out there, people who are out there honestly working hard to provide a living for their family. They lived with good character and integrity, and they weren't sucked into that. But it is stunning how many things there are out there to capture uh, a driver in a weak moment. I, I remember when Louisiana legalized the gambling and suddenly every truck stop had a little casino attached to it. And it always made me so sad to see how the industry was geared to take advantage of these people who were stuck in a place and the boredom did get set in. And I was grateful for that. I didn't have to spend two or three or four days in a truck stop waiting for a load ever. But those people were there, got captivated by all of the little machines and everything that you could put your hard-earned money into. And so, you know, as a Christian man, I was aware from the very beginning that these things were out there. And the thing is, you have to, in order to give your spouse any peace of mind, you have to be a person of integrity. And that means you're the same person in every area of your life. You live in two different worlds, but you're the same person in both of those worlds. And that transition from the world that I had been in all week back into the world that my wife had been in all week, that was another one of those things we had to work through because I would just walk in the door and suddenly it was all of the stuff of her week, which I wanted to hear, but it was just too much in the moment. And so we talked and said, look, can you give me an hour a buffer hour to come in, get changed, relax a little bit, because I want to hear about your week. I'm very interested. But man, I can't transition that quickly because the final hour of my week was the Google Expressway. So I could be pretty amped up when I came home <laughs> and um, I wasn't prepared to make that transition. So it was that constant awareness. Yeah, I think early on my wife worried a lot about it. So I reassured her that, you know, look, I'm, I'm doing my devotions. I'm in the Bible. I was, you know, trying to live this life. And, and men can live these compartmentalized lives, which can bring us a great deal of anguish at times if, if we're not really living in a circumspect way um, and considering that I represent Christ wherever I am and in whoever's company I'm in. So... This is, this is an issue of trust and doing what you say when you say you're going to do it, calling home when you say you're going to call home, and building on that trust all the time to alleviate some of those fears as best you can. Hey, Tom, I know uh, you had mentioned um, in your introduction that you're now a counselor uh, to men, and I, I definitely have a question there, but um, I wanted just to, one of the things I'm hearing uh, from you, Tom, is one, that there's just kind of built in guilt to the uh, being on the road for so long. And one of the positives, though, I'm hearing from that and the, 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 the challenge is, is that it kind of forced you and your wife to be more intentional about your relationship with one another, how you uh, raise your children together. And so you had to uh, really kind of think through some of the uh, the challenges and how to be intentional about that. And I wonder if you could just speak very brief, briefly to that of um, how that how that was a positive for you and your wife to not take these things for granted 
Um, but because of the challenges, it's how are we going to answer some of these, uh, these challenges together? Can you talk about just, um, yeah, how that was a positive thing for you? Sure. Um, I feel like, you, you know, I don't think I'm naturally attentive to my wife. And I think a lot of guys are there. If it were not for the church and the influence of the Christian radio and all of the many sermons and, and programs like Focus on the Family, that really did kind of focus on the family, the issues that, that people were going through and how to resolve and how to move toward each other. I would not have normally, naturally gravitated to caring for my wife in, in this way and being this attentive. So I credit um, my faith journey really with helping me be that, to learn it and relearn it and you know, early on, we went to Transport for Christ uh, regional retreats as a, as a company. We would take the five or six drivers that we had, you know, and there was always emphasis on family and relationships. And it's just critical. And not every person does it. But, you know, there's a lot of husbands and wives together on the on the road these days. And boy, you're living in deadly proximity <laughs> with another person in that little cab and you've got to work it out. And so th those opportunities are great. Those, those men and women that did that, I mean, always talked positively about that experience of being together on the road. And so it does require intentionality. It does require learning to listen to each other for what they're saying and what they're not saying. And you know, that's a, that's a skill that we learned as counselors, you know, how to listen well and how to ask uh, questions, clarifying questions. And, um, you know, the Bible says that husbands are to live with your wives in an understanding way. And that phrase, understanding way, implies a detective on an investigation. Mm. And if you treat your relationship like that, you know, the average marriage, in the average marriage, you'll be married to five to seven different women in your life. And she'll be married to five to seven different men because we didn't stay 20 years old. I have to know my wife as a 20 year old. I had to know her as a 30 year old and as a 40 year old and a 50 year old. We're constantly changing and growing. And the way we continue to grow together is to not let that exploration die. Consider to continue to pursue your wife or your husband continue to search for their heart in, in your conversations and explore those things together. And it makes for a really rich relationship. Hmm. Tom had said that uh, trust takes years to build between two people and only moments to destroy. And if I hear you right, and as a counselor, uh, something I want to talk to you about is the idea that Time and distance apart then have no relationship to faithfulness. Your actions really are guided by your values and not your physical proximity. Mm. And so when we come back, I want to talk about that very idea and, and talk a little more about this and ask you a, a couple other questions relating to uh, your time as a truck driver. But once again, we need to go to break. So we'll pick this up when we get back. Welcome back to Trucker's Life Radio with Ron Frazier, right here on TNCRadio.live. We're here on the program with Tom Wolf and with Derek Thompson, and we've been discussing the issue of trust and fidelity as part of the truck driving industry. Uh, Tom, it's said that a typical truck driver is depicted in the movies is often is often a big unkept kind of a foul mouth man with a girlfriend at every truck stop. While we know this really isn't the case, this stereotype does persist and persists even today. And more women and devoted husbands are, and, and fathers are, are moving freight across the country. And, and hopefully this is not the image our, our society has of our trucking community, uh, but sadly in some cases it is. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit more about this trust relationship. 
you know, we talked about it takes years to build between two people and only moments to destroy. And so I think you might say that it would be important that uh, you keep the lines of communication open between you and your spouse and and you share thoughts with one another. I mean, how, how do you get to a point where you each believe you're not going to violate each other's commitment to each other? Hmm. Yeah, great question. Um, and we just had a kind of a brief conversation offline there about, you know, the, the, the worst thing you can do is think that you will never have an issue out there. Uh, there is so much temptation abounding. And, you know, that stereotype of, of the trucker like that, uh, there are guys and women like that, but I would say the vast majority of them are not there. They're out hardworking men and women trying to earn a living, trying to hold a marriage together and a family together uh, while doing something that uh, is, is possibly the only thing they can do to make the bills, uh, to be able to afford to live where they live and do the things they love to do. So mixed in with that, uh, the thing is, they're not the ones that are loud mouthing on the radio. You know, when, when you hear the guy out there just cursing and carrying on on the radio, just look around and see how many trucks are in your vision immediately. You know, all those people aren't doing that. So uh, it, is a, it is a minority. Um, but we have to remember that we're fallible human beings and we could, we could be tempted. We could fall, you know. So it's, it's realizing that every day, being honest with your, with your spouse, uh, communicating with your spouse, talking about the realities of what it's like to be out there. Um, as Christian men or women, we, we have a responsibility to, again, uh, live with an integrity before God first and then before our spouse and families. And so that's being the same person in every area of your life and remembering to be that so that we're not, um, you know, we're not one person when we're on the road and we're another person when we're at home. And take your spiritual life or take your disciplined life onto the road. Do something constructive with it. We do have downtime. We have nights. We have evenings. We may have a weekend where we're stuck at a truck stop. You can earn an education. You can earn a degree while you're in that situation. You can read novels. You can read how-to books. You can educate yourself uh, like never, ever before. And, um, you know, put intentionality to your marriage when you are home. Do things. Take a weekend and do the family life weekend to remember. It is so enriching for your marriage. You know, your wife will trust you when you come home and you bring some intentionality to that relationship. And she knows that she's valued or he knows that he's valued. And, um, you know, do the date night thing. Um, I was not a guy who came home and then sat around for the weekend waiting to be waited on. Uh, I was uh, somewhere along the way taught in some radio program that when the guy comes home, your second job begins, you know, because your wife's already been working all day. And so I just kind of developed that. And it was a it was a given that when I came home, I would relieve my wife for however much time she needed to go out and kind of get some peace back in her soul. I, that would give me time alone with the kids. There were chores to be done. There were things to be done. And, and I tried to chip in and, and carry the load for her as much as I could when I was home. So it's, it's intentionality about your marriage. It's, your, it's intentionality about your walk before God. Yeah. Um, that's really great insight and wisdom. And I'm just curious uh, real quick uh, because everything you're sharing, I think, is resonating and, and so strong. But I'm curious about, you know, and you also have a counseling background and you've worked with men who um, have been struggling uh, with different addictive behaviors. And I, I wonder for the, for the driver out there right now who... Um, is maybe feeling trapped or stuck. Uh, maybe they haven't put in some of these practices and ha haven't been as intentional as they wanted to be. And maybe they're stuck in an addictive behavior right now or struggling or their marriage is falling apart. As a counselor, what would you share to them right now, like in the moment as they are like, man, I'm, I'm, 
I'm just barely hanging on here. Uh, what would be some wisdom that you would uh, share with them? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a great question, especially given the industry dynamic of not being home. And so, you know, running these groups for men um, that are caught up in pornography, and of course, you know, they've been led to believe internally that if their wife ever finds out, it will be the end of their marriage. Um, personally, I've not seen that happen. I've seen the wife uh, meet her husband with compassion and often forgiveness. And uh, certainly, if not in the moment, then eventually. Um, and these things, uh, the thing that we have in our groups is that the guys journey together in this program for about a year. And this is what makes the trucking world so challenging. So I am grateful for Transport for Christ launching these, these uh, initiatives to help men and women but primarily in this respect, men caught up in this world. Pornography is so invasive, it's so destructive. It is a public health concern in Pennsylvania and about 30 some other states, and you never hear about it. It's rampant in the churches and you never hear about it. So I'm grateful for Transport for Christ to reach out and, and do this gateway to freedom uh, weekend intensive. Most guys can find a way to get to the weekend intensive. And then you have to avail yourself of the network that's being offered to you. It's obviously going to be different. It's going to be online. It's going to be through apps and, and messaging. Um, but it's all we have right now because you can't get to a personal group every week for 52 weeks. And so whatever you have to do, if you are home on the weekend, find one of those groups, get yourself out of this. It doesn't just go away. And it's the same way with dr drugs and drinking and gambling. Freedom comes in education and community. And it's really the community is the challenging part of being an over the road truck driver. So it's being offered now, it's being offered online. You can be in contact with people and you can develop a relationship as best you can. Some of those um, conversations on an app may lead to an actual telephone conversation, which may lead to an actual accountability relationship and a friendship relationship that endures for years. So I would just say, if you're struggling, there's never ever been a greater time in our history where so much is being offered to help you get to freedom. I mean, Galatians 5, 1 in the Bible says, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. And so men and women out there that might be listening to this broadcast, there is help. Uh, you just have to connect with, with Transport for Christ. If that's the only thing you can think of, the only time you've heard this offer, reach out and make a connection. And we're there to help. It's what we want to do. Tom, I suppose we should tell our listeners that if they're interested in taking advantage of this retreat weekend the Gateway to Freedom is offering, they can reach us at TFC Global at 717-426-9977. Again, that is 717-426-9977. Or they can email us at info at tfcglobal.org. Again, that is info at tfcglobal.org. Tom, we're so thankful that you were able to join us today. Uh, there are so many things I suppose that we could just continue and carry on with. There's so much going on in the trucking community, uh, but I guess we're going to have to save that for another time. And hopefully we'll have you back again and, and maybe next time with your wife, Cindy, and to share some things from her perspective. Uh, but we've enjoyed having you with us and we've enjoyed spending this time together. And so thanks again, Tom, for taking time out uh, of your busy schedule uh, to be with us and to share these things with us. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much for having me. It was, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to share with you guys and with the trucking community. So thank you. Tom, I think it would be apropos. In fact, I think it would be more than appropriate 
if you were to uh, take a few minutes here and pray for the guys on the road and their families and for the difficulties that they may be facing, pray for us. Allow them to uh, know that um, uh, they have a hope. All right. Would you do that for us? Absolutely. Lord, I, th- I thank you for this opportunity. And um, Lord, there is a whole subculture out there called truckers. And Lord, they need you. Many of them know you already. And I pray for those who don't, that they might find their way to you. Um, because Lord, we need a bigger reason to do what we do. We need uh, a, a, a transcendent reason to be here. And Lord, you're the one that offers us a larger story to live into. And Lord, it's that larger story that we want to keep in mind when we're out there, that we're not just a person out there driving a truck. We're a person created in the image of God for this time and this place, because you have something for us to do. And so, Lord, I pray that you will lead truck drivers, men and women and families into your purpose and calling for each one. I pray that you will give the truck drivers on this nation's highways safety, that you would keep them from temptation. You would keep uh, them from being overwhelmed by loneliness and the different things that are out there. Lord, just watch over our nation's highways, watch over our nation, watch over the men and the women who keep supplying everything that this nation needs to continue to run. Thank you for those people, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Tom. We're yes. glad again that you were here to join us. Hey, you've been listening to TNC Radio. Live. This is Truckers Life Radio. I'm Tom Kelly along with Ron Frazier. Uh, Ron, uh, that was an excellent episode. What do you see uh, coming up in the next few weeks? Tom, we have some great Uh, great speakers coming to share with us. We've got uh, Doug Smith, who is the communications director and liaison for uh, Covenant Trucking. Uh, He's coming to be with us next week. Uh, We have Brad Huddleston, who uh, deals with a lot of the digital cocaine issues. Uh, And by that, I mean the, the phone we hold, the computers we use, how that affects us in the trucking industry. Uh, he's going to be with us on the 25th. We have Ellen Voye, who is going to be, she's the head of women in trucking. She's also chairman of the TFC Global Board. Uh, we're excited to have her. She will be with us in November, the first week in November. And then we will have David Parker, uh, who will be joining us uh, on the second week in November. Uh, and David is the president and founder of Covenant Trucking, and uh, we're looking forward to hear his story of how uh, Covenant got started and um, what he has to share with us. So we've got an exciting lineup coming all through the rest of this year, and, and we hope our listeners will be uh, there with us, join us, uh, and take part in hearing uh, what's going on in the trucking community. and. Um, be an active part of our radio program. Fantastic, Ron. And we'll look forward to uh, hearing all of those programs coming up in future weeks right here, Monday night, 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern on TNC Radio.Live. 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 Radio.Live.